Part 1. You're going to hear a conversation. Before you listen, please look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 10. Hello, Dawn. Oh, hi, Elmer. Glad I've bumped into you. I've just found a great idea for the presentation we've got to do for Dr Banks next month. What, the one on everyday objects? Yes, look at this article. It's really interesting. The aluminium Coke can. You know, Coca-Cola cans, soft drink cans. Look, let's sit down here. Have you got a minute? Sure, I'll just get my bag. OK, so you think we can get a presentation out of this article? I'm sure we can. First of all, we can provide some interesting facts about the aluminium cans that we drink out of every day. Like? Well, here it says that in the US they produce 300 million aluminium cans each day. Wow, 300 million. Exactly. That's an enormous number. It says here, outstrips the production of nails or paper clips. And they say that the manufacturers of these cans exercise as much attention and precision in producing them as aircraft manufacturers do when they make the wing of an aircraft. Really? Let's have a look. They're trying to produce the perfect can, as thin but as strong as possible. Hmm, this bit's interesting. Today's can weighs about 0.48 ounces, thinner than two pieces of paper, from this magazine, say. Yeah, and yet it can take a lot of weight. More than 90 pounds of pressure per square inch. Three times the pressure of a car tyre. OK, I agree. It's a good topic. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions. What I thought was that we could do a large picture of a Coke can and label it and then talk about the different parts. Look, I've done a rough picture here. OK, so where shall we start? Well, the lid is complicated. Let's start with the body first. I'll do a line from the centre of the can, like this, and label it body. What does it say? It's made of aluminium, of course. It's thicker at the bottom. Right, so that it can take all the pressure. And then I think you should draw another line from the body for the label. Right, label. The aluminium is ironed out until it's so thin that it produces... What does it say? A reflective surface suitable for decoration. That's right, apparently. It helps advertisers too. Yes, because it's attractively decorated. Good. And then there's the base. Yes. It says the bottom of the can is shaped like a dome so that it can resist the internal pressure. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Nor did I. OK, so going up to the lid, there are several things we can label here. There's the rim around the edge, which seals the can. Got that. And there's a funny word for the seal, isn't there? Yes, it's a flange. What does it say about it? Well, the can's filled with coke, or whatever. And after that, the top of the can is trimmed and then bent over to secure the lid. That's right. It looks like a seam. We could even do a blow-up of it, like this. F-L-A-N-G-E. Yes, that would be clearer. I think we should label the lid itself and say that it constitutes 25% of the total weight. 25%, so it's stronger than the body of the can. So, to save money, the manufacturers make it smaller than the rest of the can. Didn't know that either. So how do we open a can of Coke? Um, first of all, there's the tab, which we pull up to open the can, and that's held in place by a rivet. Um, I think that's too small for us to include. I agree, but we can talk about it in the presentation. We can show the opening, though. That's the bit of the can that drops down into a drink when we pull the tab. Yeah, hopefully. Sometimes the tab just breaks off. I know. Anyway, 
The opening is scored so that it pushes in easily but doesn't detach itself. OK, we can show that by drawing a shadow of it inside the can, like this. I'll label it scored opening. Great. Well, I think we've got the basis of a really interesting presentation. Let's go and photocopy the article. Fine. I'll take it home and study it some more. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a lecture. Before you listen, please look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 11 to 20. Evening everyone. I'd like to make a few announcements before the first performances begin at this year's Hetherington Art and Music Festival. Firstly, a short guide to some of the more important places on the site. There are three stages. Stage 1 is the main stage and this is where I am speaking from now. Stage 2 and 3 are opposite each other to the left and right of the main stage. The first aid post is located directly behind me and to the northeast of the main stage. The organiser's office is next to the rear entrance and this is where lost children can be reunited with their parents. In front of this office you will find 10 public telephones. These telephones can only be used to telephone out. They will not receive incoming calls. Toilets are to be found in all four corners of the stadium site. If you lose anything, you should make a report at the security post next to stage 2. Remember to visit the souvenir stall in the car park in front of the main entrance to the stadium. If you want to leave the stadium for any reason, please remember to keep your ticket with you, as you will not be re-admitted without it. While on this subject, to make exit and re-entry simple, could everyone leaving the site use the main entrance at the other side of the car park, leading to Gladstone Road? This is to allow performers easy access to the site through the rear gate behind the main stage. Most importantly, when leaving the area of the stadium, try to keep as quiet as possible so as not to disturb our neighbours. We have already been warned that we will not be given permission to hold the festival next year if there are complaints from local residents. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions Now that I've got the official announcements out of the way, I'd like to tell you about tonight's programme. The Brazilian drum band will be appearing on stage three at seven o'clock. This is the first time that they have performed outside South America, so their show is not to be missed. This will be followed by Claude and Jacques, who will be introducing special guests from the fields of music and dance. Meanwhile, on stage two, there is a modern ballet from Great Grapefruit Incorporated illustrating women's role in world peace. This will begin at 7 o'clock and last for roughly two hours. Stage one begins at 9 o'clock with jazz fusion band, Frost Wires, whose performance tonight is the last date on their world tour. Stage one continues with a regular guest at these festivals, comedian Tom Gobble. His show begins at 10.30. After Claude and Jacques at 9, on stage three, there will be a performance from the Flying Barito Brothers, who are acrobats with the Albanian State Circus. 
The Barito Brothers' fire-eating trapeze act is unique. No other performer has managed to equal their grand finale. From 11.15, we are happy to present Winston Smiles and the Kinston Beat, who will be playing authentic Jamaican reggae until the end of the official programme at 1.30. On stage two, the great Mr. Ron will be presenting his show of magic illusion and mystery at 9.30. During the show, he will be chained and thrown into a sealed aquarium, from which he will try to escape. If everything goes as planned, the set will finish at 11.30, and the stage will be ready for the country and western music of Bluegrass Ben and the Cattlemen at 12. This act will be the last on stage two tonight. After Tom Gobble on stage one, we have tonight's main attraction, the Prophets who will be performing in public tonight for the first time since they broke up five years ago. The news is that they are back and they will be presenting a show including old favourite songs from their new album, which is to be released in September. They are expected on stage at midnight. After the official programme has ended, there will be a number of sideshows taking place around the site. The end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation. Before you listen, please look at a questions 21 to 30. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. I'm going to speak to Eric this afternoon, the Central University's Environment and Resources Professor. Good afternoon, Eric. Good afternoon, Jane. I know that our university has recently begun a programme for recycling bottles. Can you tell us something about it? Uh, yeah, Jane. I heard that our university has been recycling bottles for about four months now. And in fact, it's totally voluntary and we find that most members are students and they all agree that there's lots of need for it. And in fact, many people ever do some recycling in their home. Mm, I'm sure. Yes, so we thought that would be a good idea to introduce it here for the students. Um, initially, we started in the university classrooms where we found there were many bottles. I can imagine. It was surprising, really. The waste came largely from water bottles and alcoholic beverage bottles and non-alcoholic beverage bottles. Right. But how did you want to start the bottle recycling process? Well, there is a government collection service that deals with the used bottles from many places and then it takes the bottles to a recycling plant to be recycled into plastic products or new bottles, such as plastic bags. I think it is great. We call it Bottle Saver. Our members also prepare boxes for students placing used bottles inside. Oh, I think I've seen some of those. I think that is quite a good idea. Me too. How much are the boxes? They only cost one dollar each and they were very large. In fact, they can carry about 20 bottles each. Hmm, that's quite a bit, isn't it? So in student records, how many boxes would you need? Uh, in student records, we've bought 12 boxes. Well, how often do the boxes get full? They fill up about every other day and we should change into empty ones as they are full and then send the bottles to the recycling plant. Turn about. Mm, so we don't need many boxes. We just fill them up as we go along while we are waiting for Bottle Saver to deal with our full boxes. It sounds great. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions.
And do you think people would like to use the used bottles as well? In theory, we would like to think so. I think so. But in fact, that is a slight problem. We encourage people to do this by having three different ways. What are those? First, there is refused bottle, bottle that is integrated and left after drink. And secondly, the recycled bottle, bottle that has no unused sides at all. The last, there is scrap bottle. That bottle is broken into small pieces, or for some reason, it is just not useful. So it should be separate, isn't it? Yeah, it is separate. And to answer your question, we encourage people to use the refused bottles and try to use them to carry something. The other bottles can be given to Bottle Saver for recycling. That's good. There are many ways for people to use bottles. Do you ever find anything undesirable in the boxes? Sometimes. For example? Well, there have been things like orange peels, bags of socks and waste paper. Once students found a wallet in the boxes. That sounds not bad. Uh -huh. Have you found the owner? Yeah, we found the owner immediately because he put his identity card in his wallet. He was so lucky. Mm. Would you say that bottle recycling process is working well? Of course. I really think that it's a great idea. And in fact, it's a good way of saving our resources. I agree with you. It's very important. We can get many kinds of plastic products made from recycled bottles. I think the great thing is that everyone feels they are doing something good when they buy products from recycled bottles. Of course. I think most people will share this view. Well, thank you for your time this afternoon. The thing you share with us is interesting. And let's hope people in our university all join in the bottle saver. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Before you listen, please look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Afternoon and welcome to this Earth Sciences Lecture. Today we're going to look at tidal waves or more correctly tsunami. Deep below the ocean's surface tectonic plates collide and every once in a while these forces produce an earthquake. The energy of such submarine earthquakes can produce tidal waves which radiate out in all directions from the epicenter of the quake, moving at speeds of up to 500 miles per hour. When these waves reach shore, they can cause enormous destruction and loss of life. Tidal waves are actually misnamed. They are not caused by tides. A more accurate word for them is the Japanese name tsunami, which means harbour wave. They are also sometimes called seismic sea waves, since they can be caused by seismic disturbances such as submarine quakes. However, that name is not really accurate either, since tsunami can also be caused by landslides, volcanic eruptions, nuclear explosions and even impacts of objects from outer space such as meteorites, asteroids and comets. Earthquakes, though, are the largest cause of tsunami. Tectonic plates cover the world's surface and their movement can be detected anywhere in the world. Some areas of the world are more prone to greater movement and it is in these places that the largest waves can occur. Large vertical movements of the Earth's crust occur at plate boundaries, which are known as faults. The Pacific Ocean's denser oceanic plates are often known to slip under continental plates in a process known as subduction, and subduction earthquakes are the most effective in generating tsunamis. A tsunami can be generated by any disturbance that displaces a large water mass from its equilibrium position. In the case of earthquake-generated tsunamis, the water column is disturbed by the uplift or subsidence of the sea floor. 
submarine landslides, which often accompany large earthquakes, as well as collapses of volcanic edifices, can also disturb the overlying water column as sediment and rock slump down and are redistributed across the sea floor. Violent submarine volcanic eruptions can create an impulsive force that uplifts the water column and generates a tsunami. Conversely, supermarine landslides and cosmic body impacts disturb the water from above as momentum from falling debris is transferred to the water into which the debris falls. Generally speaking, tsunamis generated from these mechanisms, unlike the devastating Pacific-wide tsunamis caused by earthquakes, dissipate quickly and rarely affect coastlines distant from the source area. Tsunamis are very hard to detect since they cannot be seen when they are in the deep ocean. The distance between two wave crests can be 500 kilometers and, because of this, the wave height is only a few feet. Because the rate at which a wave loses its energy is inversely related to its wavelength, tsunamis not only propagate at high speeds, they can also travel great transoceanic distances with limited energy losses. As the tsunami reaches shallow water, however, its speed decreases, but the energy it contains remains about the same. Instead of traveling fast, the wave rises high. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has set up a seismic detection system to monitor earthquakes and predict the possible arrival of tidal waves for Pacific countries. Boys at sea can also detect water pressure changes that can indicate tsunamis moving through the ocean. But when tsunamis originate near the shore, there is often little chance to warn people. Let's look at some examples of tsunamis and their causes and effects. Some can be relatively harmless. In 1992, an offshore landslide caused a tidal wave of only about three feet high that struck a low tide, so Humboldt's county, where it hit, got off easy with no casualties. On January the 13th, 1992, a Pacific Ocean earthquake off the coast of San Salvador, registering 7.6 on the Richter scale, didn't cause any ocean disturbance at all. However, a recent tidal wave which struck Papua New Guinea on July the 17th, 1998, was 23 feet high and killed at least 1,200 people. This wave was caused by a magnitude 7.1 submarine earthquake. On July the 17th, 1998, a Papua New Guinea tsunami killed roughly 3,000 people. A huge underwater volcanic eruption 15 miles offshore was followed within 10 minutes by a wave some 40 feet tall. The villages of Arup and Warapu were destroyed. One of the worst tsunami disasters engulfed whole villages in Sanriku, Japan in 1896. An underwater earthquake induced a wave of 35 feet, drowning some 26,000 people. Finally, about 8,000 years ago, a massive undersea landslide off the coast of Norway sent a 30-foot wall of water barreling into the uninhabited northern coast of Europe. If this were to reoccur today, as scientists say, it could, almost anywhere in the world, it would cost billions, if not tens of billions of dollars to repair the damage to coastal cities and kill tens of thousands of people. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.